Derek Carr's first interview of the season on the new offensive scheme. Ladies and gentlemen, don't look at me like that, Derek. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what life is all about right here. We get Derek Carr. I mean, nothing says the NFL season. Nothing says the NFL season like a Derek Carr interview. If you want to post videos like this for me to react to, make sure to post them on my subreddit where you can see right here all kind of posts from... <clears throat> Let's just uh, let's just get to the video. How, how's the transition going with the new new scheme, yep. new offense? Uh per usual, audio is crazy low on these videos. I don't know why they continue to put them outside. Billion dollar company. We switched. We switched to New Orleans dot football's video feed of the same interview. Let me tell you. Let me say this. New Orleans dot football's video. Feed quality audio is worlds better than the New Orleans Saints actual YouTube channel. We just heard the New Orleans Saints actual YouTube channel. The YouTube channel of the team. Now, I want you to listen to this. Listen to how much better this audio is right here. So how, how's the transition going with the new new scheme, yeah. new offense? How's it going? It's been worlds better. So we're going to stay on this video. Great. It's uh, a lot of similarities, um, just word-wise, verbiage-wise. So it's... That's always easier on players because it's faster for us to learn. Um, whenever the the picture is two different words in your brain, that usually takes a little bit longer. But it, that that part has helped. Um, it's been a lot of fun. These guys are awesome. You see why? It's kind of funny because all we've heard so far from everybody is how how shorter the verbiage is for this uh, offense for this scheme. Derek, being a veteran, being kind of around the block. It may be familiar. Like, it may, it may be bits and pieces familiar to him. It shows. But again, though, having the veteran, like, that is a that is what you want to hear. You want to hear your veteran quarterback, the guy who will be, will be communicating. You want to hear him say, like, yeah, I mean, you know, there's some parts that are similar, so it's not. It's pretty easy to pick up. That You want that, so that's a bonus. Again, they've had so much success. No matter where the scheme has been run, you know, there, there's been a lot of success everywhere. So... Uh, it's been a lot of fun and just been working extremely hard at it. Um, you know, learn from last year, uh, obviously going through that process and, you know, learning this one this year, found found some ways to do it better or more efficient and learn faster. And so it's been, it's been good. Derek, it Derek, what does listen to your feet mean? Listen to your feet. Your feet tell you. Listen to your feet. So listen to your feet is uh, Andrew Janoko's like the quarterback coach. It's his like main motto. He wears it on his shirts. So listen to your feet. Uh, that is that's what they're that's what they're referencing right there. Everything you saw you saw the shirts. And yeah, yeah I just said that. Derek. I don't know they probably talk about it all the time. But they're that for the quarterbacks just listening to your feet. You know, not being laid on certain things and um, staying true to your progressions and all those things. So for us, footwork's a big deal. The details um, in this system are very important for the quarterback position and how they see things and how they view things and. Uh, it's really exciting for me. This level of detail is exciting because when you're held to that standard, you, you know, usually as a professional, you play to that standard. So um, I'm excited about these coaches because they hold us to it every single day. It's really cool. I mean, fantastic answer because that is what I've been really impressed with listening to Janoko and Kubiak is their detail. It's crazy because they're NFL coaches, and you shouldn't have to say this, but going from Pete Carmichael to and Dennis Allen, like listening to them every week, and then listening, I've, I've only listened to Janoko for four minutes. I've listened to Clint Kubiak, I think, in two interviews. You can tell the difference. You can tell these guys are detailed. They're technical. They know what they're looking for. They know what they want. They, they are holding Derek and this team, offensively at least, to a much different standard than Pete Carmichael, which makes me sick to my stomach and makes me want to vomit all over my chest because Pete Carmichael held this position for 20 years. Like, it's not like Pete Carmichael was just trying out being the OC or trying out, you know, being a coach in the NFL. He was a guy who had a two-decade career in the NFL as an offensive coordinator. And you can see the difference. Like, Pete Carmichael in the interviews, I mean, it was nothing, never, ever, were we talking about anything technical, anything truly detailed and technical to the to the quarterback position, much less the offense, right? And Derek's already echoing what Janoko and Kubiak have said. So it just goes to show you, these the young, that's why this whole offseason, we've been saying young, innovative coaches, because these young, innovative coaches, they know ball. 
they know what they're talking about. They are detailed. They are analytically driven, and, and you can really see it. Yeah, the third offense in three years. What's different about learning this compared to the last couple of years? <laughs> yeah. I have no idea what that question was. I'm not going to lie to anybody here. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, at this point, you know. Um, oh, I know what it was. He said, you've had a different offense for the last three years. And, and, and kind of talk about what it's like to learn a new offense for each of the last three seasons. I, I've had the opportunity to learn learn a lot of football. And I think it's a blessing because, you know, you get to learn and your knowledge and growth in so many areas. Uh, but this, you know, this one for me with Clint and Janoke has just felt good. It's just felt right. Um, and, and for me personally, it's something that I've – you watch from afar and you're like, man, that'd be so fun to be a part of, <laughs> you know. And uh, and so I, I think just skill set wise and the guys we have and myself included, just how we fit into what we're going to be asked to do. I'm I'm just excited about that. You know, I'm sitting there watching the film, getting excited. Um, Some of the stuff Derek says, like you do have to kind of navigate the like PR responses and the canned responses and the kind of, you know, like when he said, um, when he said this one just feels right, I mean, it, it, it was it just me, ladies and gentlemen, or did that sound like the guy or the girl you know who's on their eighth relationship in three months, and they're like, no, 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 this one, this one feels right. We just get each other, and it's like you've known each other for two weeks. He's a, he works at an Arby's. Like I, you know, I don't think this this isn't exactly the picture perfect story of romance. You know what I mean? So let's give it some time. So sometimes Derek's going to have answers like that where you just got to kind of find your way through them. So, you know, it, it is what it is. That's just how he is. You know, because it's going to, like I said before, it's going to look different, um, you know, for our fans that have, you know, seen a certain way for a long time. But I think it's good. It's exciting. I've said that same thing. This ain't your daddy's New Orleans Saints offense. This ain't your grandpa's New Orleans Saints offense. Derek, <laughs> brother, sometimes I pause the, the faces that we pause on. I mean, speaking of Arby's. But this is a brand new thing, and that's what we wanted. We wanted to get away from trying to cosplay as the 2011 Saints. We wanted to quit. We wanted to quit cosplaying like, all right, Trevor Simeon, today you're playing the role of Drew Brees. Uh, Ray, uh, Keith Kirkwood, today you're playing the role of Marcus Colston. You know, like, all right, uh, Alvin Kamara, today you're Pierre Thomas. Like, that wasn't ever going to work. Pete Carmichael. Hey Pete, hey, hey, can you put down can you put down the, the the bubbles? Can you quit blowing the bubbles? Come on over here. You're playing the role of Sean Payton. Like that was never going to work. That was never ever going to be sustainable and ever going to create a culture of winning. We're done with that. We're not trying to replicate that. We're not trying to, you know, copy any of that. We're trying to be a whole new organic system. A little bit of the, the 49ers offense, a little bit of the Shanahan tree, a little bit of the Kubiak tree, a little bit of all that put together with Dennis Allen's defense, and let's see what that looks like. And that that is exciting, like to actually have something of your own, something of substance, something you're not trying to to fake. That That's a huge deal. You one thing we've heard, assuming that means back in San Francisco, how do you think when the Saints, what you guys have on offense, can translate from what San Fran had on offense? Yeah, so it's a mixture, you know. It's a mixture yeah. of some some different things with the voices and, you know, the people in the room and their experiences, right? Um, and, you know, when it's your show, it's always a little bit different than where you came from. And so, um, you know, for me, I think just for the players in our room, it translates really well. Um, you know, very... Yeah, I agree with that. So, and, you know, we talk about San Francisco a lot because of Kubiak. But you got to remember, like, it is different. Like, no one would say, like, at this point now, no one is comparing, like, Mike McDaniel and the Miami Dolphins to the 49ers. But I'm sure at the beginning, he was answering a lot of questions like, how will this be like what they do in San Francisco? There will be Kubiak's own spin on what this offense looks like. And Janoka will have a lot of input in there, too. I do agree with Derek where I think that, this team is built very similar to the 49ers as far as like the roster and the the playmakers, just how like not the level. I'm not sitting here saying like this roster is similar to the 49ers in quality and all that stuff. But when you look at the skill position players, they are very similar. Alvin Kamara is very similar to Christian McCaffrey. We ex we talked about that extensively in a video. If you'd like to see that, go check it out. Uh Taysom Hill is a player that can kind of mimic. Kyle Juszczyk can kind of mimic Debo Samuel, can kind of mimic George Kittle, Chris Olave, similar to Brandon Ayuk. So we do have players that, I mean, even Talise Fuaga, 
is going to be as athletic and asked to do the same things that Trent Williams is going to do. So we have players where are they the exact same? No, of course not. But the pieces are there to build that style of offense. We're not just starting at ground zero. You know, if we had a running back who was, if we had Jerome Bettis at running back, it's like, eh, it might be kind of difficult to run an offense that Christian McCaffrey is the engine of with someone like Jerome Bettis. It's much easier when you have someone like Alvin Kamara, who's basically a, basically the same player. You know, there are certain concepts that we started, you know, doing late last season and uh, that carry over into what we're doing now, and I thought we were really good at them with the kind of guys that we have. So, um, again, it doesn't guarantee anything, but it's exciting to see and to know that we have some experience at doing that well. You know, one thing I've heard about is shorter play calls, less verbiage in the system. How does that affect you as a quarterback? Is that helpful to just kind of get things way, way easier? Yeah, it, it helps us play faster. It helps us yeah, mentally. Efficient. Everyone's going to play faster. Um, you know, this, as I've learned in my 11 years, like the quarterback or the coach or you know, a certain position group can know so much, but it's like, what do we, what can we all handle? Because we, it's the ultimate team game, right? What is, what is best for all of us? And, you know, taking that sophistication and, you know, going like this with it and marrying, it's like, they've done a beautiful job of doing that. And, you know, that's, again, when you get around them, you're like, I see why. I, I really cannot believe the audio. Like, it happens every year with, with where they make them do the interviews. Like, in 10 seconds, it sounds like I'm playing Call of Duty. In 10 seconds, we just heard like a gator, four-wheeler, some kind of tractor situation rolling through. Then we hear the B-75 bomber flying overhead. It's crazy. Like, why is there not a room to do the media in? But Derek, what Derek's talking about, we covered earlier in the week where before, when you have a really long play call, so I'll break it down for you. When you have a really long play call, it's long because you're telling every single person or group what they're doing. You're telling wide receiver X what route he's running. You're telling the offensive line what to do. You're telling wide receiver Y what to do. When you shorten it, now what that does is the wide receiver, all he has to know is his calls. All he has to know is to be ready to listen to his part. If he's the X wide receiver, he's listening for X, and then he just has to know that part of the play. When you shorten it, you, you're telling the players less specifically and you're putting the onus on them to know what to do with the play. So it forces, hopefully, it forces all of the players to all have this universal knowledge of what's happening during the plays. Fantastic, right? It makes sense. So that is a huge benefit. Not only is it more efficient, not only is it quicker, not only can you get in and out of the huddle faster, but it also allows the individual player it kind of forces the individual player to truly understand what the offense and what the plays are doing. As you keep learning in this game, you see why they've had success and why guys can come in and have great years and uh, different positions and they can plug guys in and they play well. And, uh, you know, a lot of that starts making sense, I guess, when you see, you know, that part of it. How much do you uh, talked a couple times now, I mean, including just there, about like having seen this offense and the success it's had, like, is there a level just like of excitement with the guys just about what this can be yeah. now that you're, you're kind of in it and this is yours now? Yeah, I think there is excitement. Absolutely. Um, the cool part about this time is we're all learning together, you know, and there's something about going through it together. Like last year, I'm the guy learning everything new. You know, I'm, I'm trying to play catch up while everyone's helping me. But I mean, this is kind of a perfect time. It is kind of perfect timing for that where. Last year, Carr is playing, you know, playing catch up by himself. Like you said, everyone else is, knows what's going on. The culture and foundation has been there. The team starts to struggle. There's infighting and all that stuff. And it was a bad year. Get rid of it. Bring in a new culture. Everyone gets to say, we're starting anew. Everyone gets to say, forget the other stuff. We're learning together. We're at square one together. So it's it was almost like an emotional or mental rebuild, which I, I think is a perfect time to do that. Because now you can just completely dump all that negativity in the trash. You can take all the negativity from last season, whether it was the infighting, whether it was the coaches, whether it was players who were no longer on the roster, like no matter what it was, and there was a whole lot of it, you can throw all that away. And you can start from square one, day one, and say, all right, we're starting new, let's roll. And from what I've heard, from what I've heard, there has been a ton of, of energy in, in this, uh, in around the field, around the practices, around the training camp. So that all sounds legit. 
it all sounds like there has legitimately been a ton of energy and excitement for this team. The cool part about this is we're all starting over. And then I, I, I feel more of that leadership, that coaching role now. And so that excitement of, no, it's like this and that. And we're, but when you do something like that together, that brotherhood and that unity, it gets even tighter. And, yeah. you know, that's, I think that's the exciting part for us is that we're going through it together. We're making the mistakes. We're learning. We're doing things together. Uh, you know, so I think with that said, that brings more excitement too. You know, again, you watch the film and you're like, oh my gosh, that's awesome. Um, but the excitement is the process of doing it to hope that we can make the cut up look like that too. And, and this might be that. like a like an overly simplistic question, but like now that you've been in it a little bit, like what, why do you think why do you think this offense had so much success? Everything looks the same, you know, um, to the defense. You know, and they coaches. Question was why has this style of offense had so much success? And what Carr is starting to say is what we've kind of alluded to with the idea that. Everything is going to look the same to the defense until this offense starts to do what it does with the pre-snap motion, the creativity, moving people around. And it's up to the coaches to adjust. It's up to the coaches to see how is the defense reacting to the same looks. Okay, then how can we trick them? How can we put in some misdirection? If we expect them to react this way to this motion, then let's do it again. And how can we benefit from that? That alone is so different than last year. What were we begging for last year? We were begging for, hey, can you make an adjustment in-game? Why are we just running what seems to be scripted plays no matter what? Why are we having no rhyme or reason to what's happening? This is so far away from that because this is this offense is basically built on the idea of we're going to show them looks, we're going to see what the defense is doing, and then we are going to adjust right there live in-game to take advantage of it. Unbelievable. I, I mean, unreal how different this style is, this offense is, than what we saw last year. Do a great job of making sure, hey, run, play action, pass, screen, everything everything looks the same and it's yeah. a lot of moving parts. And so, um, you know, and that's, you know, just really, you know, whoever started it and whoever's been coaching it, you know, you know, tip of the hat to them because they, they do a fantastic job of making things look alike and and you you can you could they could give you the playbook but you don't know which one they're calling you know and so i think that that makes it really hard on the defense um uh and schematically for coordinators you know uh you know so i just think that part to me has been really impressive how everything looks the same you know when when the run game guy and the pass game guy are on the same page and everyone's speaking the same one voice and it's one philosophy and it's one that right there breeds confidence in us as players that they're going to, you know, put us in positions to have success. How much do you, like, kind of look forward to? Sorry, sorry. You talked about the catch-up. Everybody's learning at the same time now. Chemistry was a yeah. big thing last year. How much yeah. does this learning experience as a collective really build the chemistry a yeah. lot faster than it may have last year? Yeah, we are. question was, chemistry was a big issue last year. How does this process help build chemistry? Carr kind of already talked about it, so I'm sure the answers are going to be about the same. Our, yeah, I told my wife this. I was like, I... She asked me, how's everything going just a couple weeks ago? And I said, we're just, we're so far ahead of where we were last year, you know, just as a team, just as a group of guys. I mean, we're, you know, again, we're going through this process together. So, I mean, we're having guys over at our house, you know, we're not trying to find a house, you know, the guys are coming over to the house, we're having dinner, we're hanging out, we're going to their house, you know, the wives are getting together. I mean, there's, there's just so much more of that going on that we're so far ahead because while we're doing that, we're talking about, hey, what's this, step? what's the step on this? What's my foot on this? You know, what are you thinking? I'm at this landmark, you know, we're all, we're all trying to learn it and grow and do it together. And so um, I always believe if you want to, you know, if you want to go far, you got to do it together. And so you know how we keep talking about the philosophy and we keep talking about the vision and we keep talking about the culture and we keep talking about how much that has changed and how much of a difference bringing in a new vision, a new energy, getting away from the inside, getting away from keep just hiring people from the inside and keeping everything the same and, you know, trying to repeat Sean Payton and trying to keep that all together. We have been preaching that since last season that the answers weren't in the building as much as Mickey Loomis thought they were. The answers weren't there. The culture, the plan, the vision, the strategy was all rotten. You know, it, we had to get rid of it. We had to rip it all up, start anew. Even if the results aren't there, even if we win eight games, seven games, eight games, nine games, whatever, even if Carr isn't 
an MVP level player, even if Carr isn't a top 10 quarterback, even if the offense is not number one offense in the NFL. This right here should give you enough hype and enough excitement for the future of the team that it really doesn't matter how you feel about Derek Carr. It really doesn't matter how you feel about Dennis Allen because just the willingness to take the steps forward, the willingness to say, to say you know what, let's start a new culture. Let's start a new vision. Let's, start, let's get new energy in here. Let's get new blood in here. Just that willingness to evolve. The fearlessness to innovate and evolve, just that alone should make you excited for the future of the Saints, even if it doesn't mean we're winning the Super Bowl next year. But we're on the track. We're on the track to build something. We're on the track to build a new era, to build a new chapter, and to have something to, to be excited about, something that is truly ours, something that the city, everyone can be excited about and believe in. We're on that track. Will it happen this year? Who the hell knows? Will Derek Carr be the guy to lead us there? Who the hell knows? Will Dennis Allen be, be the one to lead us there? I don't know. But I can tell you that we're moving forward. We're taking steps forward because we're leaving the past in the rearview mirror. So, um, I think that's the fun part about this year, that, yeah, we are learning something new. And, yes, it is. It, it, it's very mentally taxing to do that. But when you're all doing it together, it's it's cool how you can come together and do stuff like that. What are your initial thoughts just on the quarterback room you're in this year? With, yeah. With uh, Hainer and Rattler and obviously Peterman as well. They are – the two young guys have been unbelievable, you know, asking questions, learning and growing. And uh, and I'm just trying to do my best to help them as much as I can while I'm getting ready myself, you know. And I told them. I think it's a perfect situation for Carr. I think Carr wants to be the veteran who's teaching and instilling and advising and all that stuff. I think he likes that. He likes that feeling of being the captain, the leader. The he, That's what he wants to be. Simultaneously, I, I think he works best when he's not under pressure. I don't think Carr would like having a first-round quarterback a la Michael Penix breathing down his neck. I don't think he would like that. So that's a perfect situation where I think he feels I'm not really being pressured by Hayner and Rattler. They're not going to take my job. The team has full confidence in me. The team has full faith in me. Carr wants to be liked. So I think him knowing like the team, the team is with me, even though we have these young guys. And he still gets to be that kind of fatherly figure. In the, in the team setting, not like a personal father figure, but just like teaching teaching a rookie quarterback how to, you know, how to read a playbook, how to move around an NFL locker room, how to how to travel, all that, you know. So it's a it's a situation I think that really fits him. Oh, I was like, I'm an open book. Whatever I can do to ever help you guys, um, but I think the personalities are unbelievable, you know, in our room. You know, Nate, I've been I've played with Nate. You know, I've been in the room with Nate. I know how Nate operates. I know how Nate prepares. He is the ultimate professional, and I think that's why coaches love him and players love him um, that have played with him because he's the ultimate pro. He's going to do everything in his power to do things right. Great teammate, great great leader, encouraging, you know, helping guys on the side. Stuff no one will see, but he's, he's there. He's doing it. He's a coach, you know, um, and, he, and he's the benefit he has to me just in, a, in a, just in a game week is, you know, really been second to none. You know, the, the amount of work he puts in to help me, you know, he, he was always awesome at that. And then Spencer and Jake is just watching those two young guys. They're just starting. You know, I was sitting next to Spencer. He's like, what year is this? I was like, it's 11. He goes, I was like, what were you doing 11 years ago? He said, I was 12, you know? So I was like, I was like, bro, anything I can ever do to. The Peterman thing is interesting too, because a lot of the times certain quarterbacks, like I, I think it was, it might've been Kyle Trask that was saying this about Brady. It was one of Brady's backups, but they were asking him like, what, like, what do you do? You know, like you're the backup of Tom Brady. Like what, what is your day to day? And he basically said, like, my my goal is not to my goal is not to try and like beat Tom Brady out. My goal is to make Tom Brady better. So you would always see them on the sideline, like hyping Brady up or really talking to Brady or really trying to just be there for him or whatever. And he was almost like his hype man. And I think that's what Peterman probably is to Carl. Like Peterman's not trying to be a starting quarterback in the NFL. So Peterman, a lot of his day to day is probably like very focused on car, like making sure car is good, car is ready, he's prepared, you know, breaking down stuff for him, not breaking down stuff separately, but almost acting like a, like an advisor, like a counsel for car. To help you, and he knows this. I've told him on the phone. I called him after he was drafted. Um, you know, I, I said, anything I can ever do to see you just have the life and career you ever could dream of, I'm here for you. And, uh, and he's been asking questions. That's the one thing I love. He's hungry, you know, to learn. He's hungry to, you know, to understand, you know, hey, I saw that. What was that? You know, all that kind of stuff. So 
anyway, I just, I, I love our room. Um, and, and it's been a lot of fun watching just in this, you know, I know it's one practice, but we've been together, you know, for, for a while now. So it's been fun to grow and, you know, help teach those guys. Well, well and then I'll, then go out here and do a rep, show them and be like, see, that's what I'm talking about with the eyes or, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's been a lot of fun. Derek, what was it like for you, rookie year to year two, what do you think Jake might be going through? Is it a little bit easier? Yeah, the game slows down so much. Yes, the game game definitely slows down. Um, you know, you know where to stand in the stretch line. You know, you know what to do with, for the meal time. You know, like it's like yeah, like stuff like that. Like people never think about. It. I always think it's fascinating. Like, like think about the little things. I mean, even when you get a new job, like you know your first day at work, you don't know where the break room is. You don't know when the where the bathroom is. You don't know what people wear. You don't know anything. You don't know how any of that works. Now imagine it's an NFL team. Now imagine you're surrounded by alpha dog, top of the line athlete, multi millionaires. Oh, and you're playing in front of eighty thousand people or sixty thousand people or whatever. Oh, and people are talking about you every single day, twenty four seven, a la me or ESPN or whatever else. Like it's it's crazy to think about the human nature of when you're a rookie. Like where do I even get food? I, I need Gatorade. Where is the Gatorade? Like where's the bathrooms? Where do you know? Like where do I stand in the stretch line? So from one year to two years, like just having that, having that confidence and that and that comfortableness with the team and the team setting, that that has to be a whole different world. Like stuff you don't even think about because you've been at the same college forever. But you know, when you get out here, especially when you're around guys again that've been here ten years, fourteen years, like Cam, you know, <laughs> you know, it's it's it can be intimidating your first year because you don't want to do anything wrong. And uh, but I think he's his his mental capacity. He obviously has the physical talent um, to be a great quarterback and. Anyone going from year one to year two, I expect, you know, to see jumps in those guys, and they'll they'll do a fantastic job. But Jake has done an, an absolutely wonderful job, and now he's learning a new system, you know. And he's obviously asking me questions: How did you, how do you do this? You know, I just his whole rookie year was one thing. Now it's something different, and so just giving him tips and stuff on that. But he's ahead because he's been in it a little bit. How much has the, the speed really shown with the offense, the ability to get in out of the huddle, but to execute the plays? How much has that really shown in Jake? All right, so he asked the speed of the offense, like getting in and out of the huddles, like all that. How much? How much is that shown in, in just day one? Yeah, day one was it's definitely emphasized. We can still be better at it. Um, you know, we, again, we're we're getting in our football shape now. We've, we're getting the we're in condition to come out here and run all day, but football shape is different. You know, we got to get in our football shape and be better at that, so we can so we can put stress on the defense with. Again, showing them the same look, but quicker, and then doing something different. You know, doing all that kind of stuff. So uh, you could feel it. You know, you feel the energy from the coaches, and and they even said they're going to be even harder up about that right there tomorrow. And uh, it's just going to continually push us in the right direction. Speaking of coaches, what were your first thoughts about Clint Kubiak, and what really verified to you how much he was the right hire for this job? Yeah, I got question was, what's your thoughts on Clint Kubiak? Got to, you know, I don't remember when it was, but when I just talking to him and just. For the first however many minutes we talked, it was just about who he was as a person, who I was as a person, our families, you know, what what he's about and all this kind of stuff. And you you begin to realize just, you know, the great the great family that he came from. You know, we, we talked about, you know, you know, we we asked fun questions in Corbin. Mean, if you if you could play golf with any anybody in the world and everyone's saying Tiger, you know, you know, whoever, everyone's saying whatever, and then he gets up and says, I just my dad and my brothers. <laughs> Such a Clint Kubiak answer. I mean, that's just Clint Kubiak to a T. I, I, 100%. If you would have gave me, if you would have told me what's Clint Kubiak going to say, I would have said he's going to say his dad. Like, no doubt about it. That's just a Clint Kubiak. And Derek probably would have said the same thing because that's kind of a Derek answer as well. Like, you, you can tell a man loves his family and was raised a good way if that's his answer, you know. And uh, that's, But that's just him. And so I've just... I've thoroughly enjoyed him as a person and as a coach. He's been awesome. He, every time I do something, whether it's great, whether it's not great, he's on me about every detail, every just being excellent. And he's so encouraging at the same time. You know, yeah. You know, Coach Gruden was that way with being able to demand, but also making you feel great at the same time. It was he had a funny way about how to do that, and I think Clint has that too. Have you gotten a chance to sit down with Gary at all? I saw you here today. I did. I, I I got to say hi to him. I remember seeing him when I was a kid. You know. Um, but oh, they got Gary Kubiak walking around. Gary Kubiak's walking around the uh, the training ground. Oh, big Gary. Oh, oh man, I wish they would have popped him on the interview. I said hi to him for a little bit, but I can't wait to sit down and ask him some fun questions about, especially this system and all that. But yeah. We Gary, Ty, Ty had said earlier that one of DA's first messages you all this offseason was just 
you know, we just need to keep our head down and work. Yes. Don't worry about expectations outside the building. I mean, what's been the theme, I guess, from him to you all? Yeah. And Dennis hates outside noise. Hates the outside noise. That that is that is one thing I've I've not liked about Dennis's answers. He's always trying to pit the outside noise, the outside voices. He's always trying to pit that against the players. And when you do that, I think it does harbor kind of an element of the players resenting the fans or resenting the outside media and all that stuff. And is that's not really how it should be. You know, it, it should be, you know, of course you don't want to get like enveloped in them, but Dennis, I, I think uses it as like a cheap heat. He's like cheap, a cheap way to to rally the troops is don't listen to them. You know, we're all in here. Any, all, the only thing that matters is here. It's not them. It's not that, you know, I, and like I said, I think that, Sometimes that can create a bit of an ill will between the outside voices, which are the fans and the media, and the players themselves. Yeah, the message is awesome. It's been exactly that, you know. And and us as players, it's just like, you know, last year we were so excited, you know, everyone was so excited, but we really didn't show why we were so excited until it was too late, <laughs> you know. Well, you know, what's kind of funny about that is that it really wasn't until the outside voices were too loud to ignore the Lions game that we saw a better version of the Saints. When they when they were getting booed off the field and it was apparent, like, hey, things aren't awesome, that was kind of the turning point in the season. But when you insulate, like Dennis Allen kind of preaches, when you insulate like that, it can almost turn into, like, denial when you're having a horrible start like they were. And it kind of was denial, where we would hear the same thing in, the, in these interviews. Every week we'd hear, like, no, things are great. You know, we're good. We're great. Everyone's happy. We're having this. And then you go and have like 47 passing yards in the first half. You know, it's like, my, my man, it's not, things are not great. Things are not happy. Like, this is horrific. Like, the, the streets are, we're about to riot out here, you know? So there is a, there is a balance there. Right. Um, and so for us, we, you know, you get humbled a little bit. You go nine and eight, and it's like, that's unacceptable for what we have in that room. Um, yes. And so absolutely. take a step back and, you, you know, Put everything in, in perspective and you're like hey yes this yes that but what can we do this year and it's just let's just keep our mouth shut keep our head down it's okay to be excited you know um but getting talking about it and all that kind of stuff it you know it really doesn't matter as we all know like that stuff don't matter so for us it's just we're going to work uh we know the work we've put in we know the extra work you know that was another thing pa said you know he you know he asked cam he asked me he asked you know how many super bowls you guys got none he's like then i need more he goes to the young guys, how many you got? Obviously, they got none. You know, he's like, well, I need more. And so he just the, since we got here day one, when, whenever that was, April, whatever, it, we have been giving more every day. What does that look like? Man, more study time, grabbing the young guys, teaching them, getting them up on the board, you know, more time in the weight room, extra runs, extra throws. What, we're just trying to do more so that when we get back out there on the field, we can make our fans proud, you know. And, there you go. There you go. And they can be proud of the, the football that they see on tape because last year, it was not good enough. And, and that starts with, you know, me as a person, I won't speak for him, but that starts with me personally. It's just not good enough. No matter what or why, it doesn't matter. It wasn't good enough. And so we've just been really focused on making sure we're doing more now. We're not talking about it. We're just doing the work so that when we come, you know, back after training camp, uh, you know, we make our fans proud with the, you know, the image of football that they see. Hell of an answer. Because, man, last year that football was some tough football to watch. Oh, baby. I mean, some of those games, the Vikings game, the second half of the Packers game, even some of the games we won, the Titans game, like that was some of the worst football I have ever seen. Going into half, six points, three points, nine points, six points, nine points. Brutal. Really bad. Even when we were good, we were bad. Like even the, even the... You know, like the the Bears game, like even that game, hard to watch, not fun. You know, like so he's right. Like it, there is something to that of just like we want to be an, a pleasant to watch football team. We want to ha to do something that is pleasant to watch. So I'm I'm glad that he's referenced that, and I and I think that it will be. Expectations that are there are fairly low. I think outside yeah. the building. I mean, does that matter to you all? Do you care? No, no, I. I've been on teams where that was the case and that was our best team, you know, and then you come in and you, you play good football and, you know, you just try and string days together. And so 
as again, as we all know, like the the preseason, the you know, they, we think the Saints are here or this position group is this or that. It's like it it literally doesn't matter. You know, we get to put the ball down, and that's the exciting part about this game is you always get another chance. You know, not every time, but this group of guys will get another chance to put that ball down and be like, this is what Saints football is this year. And so that part we're excited for. But again, we're trying to you know stay locked in and just in just the process and just i think they'll have a chip on their shoulder i think the team will have a chip on their shoulder it was a really bad season for the players like i said the infighting the chemistry the fans booing them you know coaches getting fired and turnover and players that were you know getting let go or removed like it was a very tumultuous season for the players so the players who are there I would think are coming into this with a pretty serious chip on their shoulder. The, the misery of the work, you know, as Gruden would always tell me, he's like, you gotta love the misery. And so he would always tell me, you love to be miserable. I was like, I really don't, you know, <laughs> but Maybe just, you do. <laughs> but just that mindset, you know, of choosing to be okay in that atmosphere. They tried to kick our butt, you know, they're trying to kick our butt out here. I threw two of the worst out routes of my life. Cause I was so tired. You know, they're, they're trying to kick our butt, make it hard in that moment. So that when you get to team, it's like, oh my gosh, I feel great, you know. And so we're just trying to stress that to where the games are, again, what we want them to be. Derek, do you feel you're you're a step ahead? I know you, you got a new OC and everything, but this is your second year yeah. with the organization. You, you you feel like a little, I don't know, I don't know if comfortable is the right word in my word. Yeah, I, again, comfortable is like a tricky word for me, but I feel good. He's got to be. I mean, Carr has to be, has to feel better because, again, like he said, last year, you're trying to find a place to live. Like you're trying to get your kids into different schools or move your family. Your you're, you know, car is trying to make a first impression on all these players who have been there and these coaches who have been there. So he kind of gets a, a do-over as far as like in the locker room. I think Carr that first year, I think everyone gets a do-over. I, think, I, I would assume everyone on that team is kind of agreed. Like, you know what? Last year was last year. We're starting fresh. So Carr probably feels like, okay, thank God. I can I can start new. However, we start this year, that's going to be the impact. So he kind of it's the rare situation where he almost gets to make a first impression twice. Good. I, I I do feel ahead. I do. I feel ahead with my teammates. I feel ahead as a leader. I feel ahead. Uh, we've we've done some really cool things. Not even like in the building, but just stuff outside the building together. Like I feel great there. Uh, some of some teammates. You know, we're, we've done some really cool things for some people in some in the community here that. If you remember, Sean Payton did that with Denver. When he first got to Denver, he dogged Nathaniel Hackett. It was all over the news. He said, like, that was some of the worst coaching I've ever seen. And that's what Payton was trying to do. Payton was trying to tell the players, like, forget all that. This is new. This is a new culture. This is a new standard. All that was garbage. It wasn't y'all's fault, is what he was trying to say. Blame it on Hackett. Blame it on the people who are not here. Now let's start fresh. That same kind of mentality is what's happening, I believe, with the Saints team, where a lot of them are saying that was all that situation. That was the combination of Pete Carmichael and bad chemistry and bad whatever. All that's out. And now we can show what we're really made of. So and at the time, I remember saying, like, Peyton, this is genius. Peyton knows what he's doing. 100% knows what he's doing. And it kind of inadvertently happened with the Saints team. No one's going to hear about, but we've – but. but but we've had the bond to in the relationship to go do those things and go bless certain communities and go do certain things. And so I, I just love that because that was my dream from the beginning. I just didn't know how hard it was going to be to find a church, find a school, find a house, make sure my wife's okay. You know, she doesn't have any friends out here yet. You know, it's like, I really didn't factor in how much it would affect my family. Uh, but this time I, I told my wife, I was like, look, I'm what my teammates need me. I'm 100% doing anything they ask. And there was one weekend where they, I had like eight things, you know, that we were doing. But I was like, I, I made that commitment to my team because I made, made that commitment to our, to our city, you know. And that's what, you know, I guess I'm more comfortable in is that I get to just be me, love on the people, you know, love on the people at, over the park. My kids are having baseball games. The one baseball game finished, all the other kids come run up, hanging out with them and throwing the ball to them and, you know, signing, signing hats, parents getting mags and signing bats and stuff, you know. <laughs> this sounds cringy it sounds very flowery and very whatever but this is car this is what he wants so if he's getting it if he's feeling it if he's saying it 
you know, if it's happening, even if it's happening, however he sees it happening or whatever, good, good. Because that like Mayberry kind of, you know, white picket fence kind of scene that he's painting, that's all fine. If that's what he wants to be motivated by is the city and the city loving him and the kids chanting his name and cheering him in the street or whatever, if that's what he wants to be motivated by and fueled by to give us success on the field and to be a leader and to be the leader that we want him to be, I'm all fine with it. I'm all fine with it. So that is a far cry from being booed off of the field by the fans at home, right? So winning is the winning is the greatest band-aid. I promise you this, ladies and gentlemen, if we come out and win the, the NFC South and we have a good season and Derek Carr performs well, the city will love Carr. You will not you will not see any Mardi Gras floats making fun of him or whatever. If he wants to if he truly wants to be this city's hero, he can be. Just win. <laughs> you know, three hundred dollar bathway, you don't want me to sign that. You're about to go use it. Um, but just that, just being in, ingrained in the community, in our neighborhood, at our church, you know, you know, just loving on people, that's I guess that's where I'm most excited because I feel like myself more now than I did probably twelve months ago. When you when you have a coordinator coordinator on the side of the ball where you play as a player does the offseason the voluntary offseason stuff take on any additional significance or how do you feel about that and I ask in the context because there were like two veteran running backs who are not here and you know yet and there's a scheme that kind of emphasizes this outside zone running and stuff like that yeah how do you what's your perspective on are that? you saying like for uh, veteran players not being here I'm sorry I won't or 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 I mean, just just in general. I mean, uh -huh. what's your view on if there's a new coordinator on the side of the ball where I play? Do the got it, off got season it, got it. voluntary stuff does does it take on any more or any additional significance? I got. It. So I thought that's what the question was. The original question he left out the word new, but I, I, I picked up what he was saying. So his question is, because I was a bit of a bit of a riddle. His question is, when there's a new coordinator on your side of the ball, does that make every moment more important to learn because you're learning a new coordinator is what is what the actual question is which i would assume is yes like you you know if you know the coordinator you know the system you know the scheme you could probably miss a few of those these voluntary or involuntary workouts uh but our voluntary workouts but if you have a new coordinator you probably want to be doing everything you can that's it yes so mickey you know obviously made a emphasis about what winning football looks like mm -hmm. um you know, and DA's made that emphasis. Us as players have made that emphasis of what it looks like. And um, and during the voluntary time, we've had guys here. And um, I think they said it's better numbers than, I don't know what it has been, but it's better numbers, I guess. Um, and, you know, some days you come in there at 6, you know, 6.30, 7 o'clock, and the weight room's packed, you know. And it was it's really good to see because guys are hungry. Never wrong so to be strong. Obviously, we can't do much with the coaches during certain times, but you see, like, veteran guys grabbing young guys in – you know, I was getting together with other position groups and, you know, because I was, when I dive in, I dive in, you know, hard. Kind of wild the reporter threw, I'm guessing, Jamal Williams and Alvin Kamara. He threw them under the bus. That was, that was kind of nuts. Like, hey, hey, reporter, I'm not, a little note. That's probably not how you get exclusive interviews, my guy. And so teaching and all that kind of stuff. So that stuff was happening. So, yeah, me as a player, like, my pro especially at quarterback, you're going to be at everything. But, you know, there's there's obviously – some guys that get ready other ways, but I feel comfortable with whoever's not here that they're mentally going to be ready uh, for sure because they they came in, there was a lot of work being done, and so I feel comfortable with that for they're sure. Gonna, Last word. If you're that reporter, by the way, if, if you want to, if you're going to go that route, like he, he at that point, he, I mean, he said two veteran running backs are not here. If you want to go that route, because he could have asked the question without saying that, but if you want to try and get like a real juicy sound bite like that, you might as well just go balls to the wall and say, do you think it's a big deal that Alvin Kamara is not here? If that's what he's alluding to, ask it. I've said it a million times for all you young journalists. Do not ever make the mistake that the person you're interviewing understands the question. You better spell it out for them. If you want a certain answer, spell it out for them. And that reporter, I'm not sure who that was, obviously wanted that answer so he didn't get it but he should have said are you surprised that veterans like whoever he's alluding to aren't here and just let 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 it go that way not that the answer would have changed but 
you know, at least he would have got his answer out there. But que controversial yet brave question by that guy. Played with rookie tackles before. Is that a, when you kind of go into a season knowing that you know, wherever it lands, kind of, you're going to have a rookie somewhere, is that a process that you have to kind of start earlier in terms of just that comfortability with a player that's making their NFL debut and maybe protecting the blind side? Oh, yeah. I mean, you, you know, at some point there may be a, a player or two that they would love to have back. Um, but I played a year where we started two, you know, rookie tackles. And that was uh, a learning curve for all of us. I had to learn how to be efficient, how to stay on time, even if it wasn't perfect. And so it doesn't have to be perfect every single time, uh, you know, to be able to make the plays, but you understand that there's going to be a learning curve for that guy as well. Um, but there's no worry. I mean, based on what we've seen from the guy, from Tali and how hard he works and uh, from the other young guys, I'm, I'm just excited to see those guys continue to flourish. But there's no different mindset for me as just playing. Uh, I, you know, I got to do my job, listen to my feet, all that kind of stuff. Certainly can't be worse than what we had last year. So he's probably thinking like, hey, man, I mean, it's, you know, anything's better than nothing. Good interview. Good first interview. A lot of the answers were things that we've been saying, which is, which of course is good for me because that means that we are lined up with what's happening. We are seeing things clear. The third eye is open, ladies and gentlemen. We are locked in. So if we would have been saying things for the last three, four weeks on daily videos that are you know, the fastest rising channel, and <clears throat> if we would have been saying things and then Carr comes out here or the coaches come out here or say the complete opposite, then I got to reevaluate what I'm, what I'm talking about. But the fact that we've been saying things that now we are hearing from Derek Carr, Clint Kubiak, Andrew Janoko, we're hearing from all the players, we're hearing from all the coaches, it means we're lined up. So... This channel is going to keep pumping out the content, and it's going to be fast and furious, ladies and gentlemen. I'll tell you that right now. It's going to be fast and furious. The, the interviews, the OTAs, all this stuff's coming out quick. It was, it has been the off season. Now it might as well be the season because when the interviews happen, we're reacting to them. When news breaks, we're going to, we're pumping it out there. So this is the place to be. Thank you very much for watching. I will see you in the next video.